Great. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to be hosting this conversation. This is the first of three webinars that we're hosting, which are feeding into our annual Future of Sustainability report. And the purpose of today's discussion is to really think about what is it that we can all do in our different organizations to harness this moment of incredible disruption, but to do things differently to ensure that we drive the delivery of a truly sustainable future. And all of the insights that we'll be sharing today will feed into the future of sustainability report. So everything we do today will really count. We've got a pretty action-packed agenda for you all today um, with four great panelists and I have a co-host as well. Um, and before I introduce our panelists and co-host, for those of you not familiar with the forum, I just wanted to say a quick word about who we are. We are a sustainable development nonprofit. We're based here in the UK, also in New York, Singapore and Mumbai. And we're here to try and address really critical sustainability challenges by catalyzing change in key systems. And we do that through taking a very deliberate systems change and futures approach, which is really the basis of our conversation for today. Um, if I may, I'd like now to introduce our panelists. Um, there you all are, thank you very much. We have some wonderful contributors today. Um, so first of all, my co-host, Hannah, who is the UK Europe Director of Forum for the Future. And you're going to be introduced in alphabetical organizational order, because I thought that was a very democratic way <laughs> of, of going about this. So we have Keith Reiter from Betters and Taylors. Keith is the Supply Chain Director. We have Leslie Johnson, who is the CEO of the Louders Foundation. Um, some of you may appreciate that the Louders Foundation was previously the CNA Foundation. We have Nick Cliff, who is the Challenge Director from Innovate UK. And then last but by no means least, we have Rebecca Marmot, who is the Chief Sustainability Office of Unilever. All four organizations have been working with Forum now for a long time, and it's just lovely to see you all today. Um, our format for today is really a conversation um, focusing on two key, two key questions. How have we already responded to this pandemic and how has that furthered our sustainability ambitions? And then critically, what is it that we can do differently as we emerge from this crisis to really maximize the chances of that fair, just resilient, sustainable future emerging? Um, we have got live polls, which is very exciting. Um, so this is going to be an interactive session. We're really keen to involve you all um, in our virtual room. And we would also like to encourage you to use the Q&A function. We'll be monitoring that as we go through the conversation. There will be time at the end to look at the Q&A and to pose those to our panelists. Before we start, what would be really great is if we could run our first poll and get a sense of who's all in this conversation today. Um, so you should be able to see the poll in front of you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just clicking the right button and that will give us a sense of who our audience is. So we'll just give it a few moments. So we can see quite a few individuals from business and then reasonably even spread across other sectors with charity nonprofit perhaps being um, the second most um, representative se section of our audience. Great. Um, so around half of our audience are business and the rest are beautifully spread amongst a whole range of different perspectives, which is great. So thank you all for that. It's always good to know who we have in the conversation. Um, just before then we turn to um, our panelists and pose the, the first question, we did run a pre-survey uh, poll ahead of um, this particular session today. And I think, do I need to click? Yeah. So a um, hundred of you humoured us and answered the pre-survey questionnaire, which is fabulous. Um, and I think this is really, really great context for the conversation that we're having today. So we asked a number of questions. Um, the first question focused on that sort of quite personal perspective. How has the pandemic influenced personal values? Um, and 
nearly 80% said it's put my personal values into greater focus, which when it comes to driving sustainability, we know is really important because the organizations across all sectors that are able to really turbocharge sustainability is the organizations that have really harnessed the personal value set of their employees. Um, half of the respondents felt that their values aligned, which is again, great to see. And I think what's really interesting is that 37% felt that the pandemic had increased the organization's ambition to deliver sustainable development. Um, well, for some it hadn't, but I draw huge, um, huge heart from that over a third that said that the pandemic had increased their organization's ambition and certainly through conversations we have with our partners we, we see that and then the last data point which I think again is really critical the number of respondents 24 percent that felt that the pandemic had made it easier for the organization's ability to deliver the SDGs and this number was even higher amongst that cohort that said that the ambition had increased and I think what's really heartening is that we can draw from this um, survey that the conditions are there for us to perhaps up our ambition on sustainability as we exit from this pandemic. So without further ado, I'd like to turn back to um, our panelists and I will um, turn to you all in the order that I introduced you, if I may. And the first of our two questions for consideration this afternoon is, as follows, what have you and your organization done differently as a result of the pandemic? And what will you keep that would be consistent with a strong sustainability ambition? Keith, to you first. Thanks, Sally. Um, when when COVID-19 broke, we, we did five um, key uh, things which were different. I mean, lots of things across the business, but particularly to, with our supply chain. Um, the first was that we launched an emergency uh, response fund, which was uh, initially for, for half a million pounds. So particularly with our tea and coffee growers, we could uh, respond to immediate needs, be that about food security, healthcare, water, hand washing and, and, and sanitation. Um, we, we've also uh, recognised the fact that whether we're in a resilience or a recovery phase, that, that more money was also required and we've secured another half a million pounds um, looking forward in the weeks and months to come. Um, the second one was um, with, with all our growers, we um, have, have put in place long term agreements. We, we had these originally. Um, but we've extended those, we've shared volumes and we've made um, or hopefully created greater certainty when times have been uncertain. We recognised quite quickly on that the foundations and fundamentals of our business was strong. So we went out on the front foot to pass that on to, to our growers. Um, the third one was about liquidity and, and understanding that everybody's liquidity is impacted really, really quickly, particularly those people more marginalised. So we looked at all the payment terms that we had in place and uh, we effectively reduced all of those. So um, released cash from within our business and made all payment terms net cash against documents. So we were paying as quickly as possible, as well as when there was needs for uh, other forms of lending to triage with um, social lenders to demonstrate the contracts that we had in place and also making a commitment so that more money could be accessed. The other one was that we didn't want to um, divert or water down what we're doing in other areas of an ambitious sustainability agenda. Um, so we've doubled down on our commitments about working towards a living wage and living income to 2025. We have um, carbon neutral products now and we remain committed to those. And we're also working hard by 2025 to move away from oil based um, plastic. So we're going out and at the same time underpinning what we're doing with COVID saying this agenda still counts mm -hmm. and we're going to work on that. And the other thing is, the final thing is, we're reporting on that, we're publishing it on our website. We moved to be transparent, uh, you know, a couple of years ago about who we're working with and how we're doing it, but also to invite people in, uh, let them know how we're doing, to share what we're doing and, 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 and to um, see where the challenges are. And, and that, that, that's it in a nutshell. Great. And which of those things are you going to keep if um, or, or all of them will kind of be part of your ambition going forward? 
Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a great question. So all of those will remain. Um, you know, I think we will we will uh, underpin that commitment. I think one of the ones that we really want to turbo is one about um, living wage and living income and value distribution model, particularly in tropical agricultural um, commodities. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, what, what this has highlighted in COVID-19, and there aren't issues, obviously, that we're not aware of, but um, has really highlighted the vulnerability of uh, you know many people within our supply chain and we want to find a new and different and quicker way to respond to that and that can be all sorts of different ways from making sure that we can put technology in people's hands to make sure that the people that we want to benefit are benefiting from mm -hmm. the prices and, and the value that we've got to also working to improve um, productivity in certain areas but also for other growers to um, start perhaps moving out of tea and coffee as well so actually uh, really leaning into what what that needs to look like. Great, thank you very much Keith. Moving to Leslie who heads up a really ambitious philanthropic organisation, same question to, to you Leslie, um, what have you done differently and what might you keep? Sure, thanks Sally. Um, so I, I'd like to respond both in the short term and then sort of the medium and longer term because in the short term our focus was very much on keeping the lights on with our partners. I mean, as a foundation, we have a deep commitment to ensuring that they continue to operate because they're very much at the front line of many of the most vulnerable communities and families um, that we're, we're working to support. So like you just heard, we also launched an emergency fund. This was focused very much on core support to partners. It went out to about 56 partners, 70% of which were grassroots organizations. What was interesting is that more than half of those chose to actually pass through that funding to beneficiaries, literally to put food on the table. So this was really an emergency fund to basically keep people alive. That's how dire things have been in places like India and Bangladesh. So overall, we put 3.5 million euros into this. That's also helped us unlock another four. So there's been a lot of leverage by putting this in early and quickly, we've been able to bring other funders along. That was the short term, but in the medium and longer term, we started thinking about strategically, what does this mean for the work we're doing as Loudus Foundation? Specifically, you know, this Overton window is opening. Um, so this idea that the public sector does have a bigger role to play is there. Our minds are open to perhaps accepting that. And as policies are being drafted, bailouts, stimulus packages, et cetera, there's an opportunity. So as a foundation, we started looking at who can we work with, partners like the New Economics Foundation to actually support that work to influence policy, to look at new social security systems, to look at basic guaranteed incomes, et cetera, or these social protections that our current system doesn't have. So that's more the policy point. But there's also another area where we've started to go deeper in, which is around narrative. And the, the good news is we don't have to tell people the system's broken because that's pretty clear. I think that COVID has shown the deep cracks and the inequalities and injustice in the system. But that narrative, at some point our, our minds will close. We're talking about build back better and this great reset. Well, what does that actually mean? And what it means for industry, because we're working through business and industry, is that we need to get going. If you look at industry S-curves and how innovation is actually mainstreamed in an industry, I think Nigel Topping said it very well, that if you wanna to get to net zero shipping by 2050, you have to have a zero carbon ship on the water by 2030, you have to have them built by 2027, you have to have them ordered by 2025, and you need to have them designed by 2023. So you kinda of have to start next year. So if that's the case, as a foundation, we're trying to fund the research and the narrative needed to push industry to move a little bit faster. Great, thank you very much. Um, so now, uh, gain a different perspective. Nick uh, works for Innovate UK. Same question to you, Nick, as a government um, agency, what have you done differently in this crisis? So, first of all, uh, you know, I came to answer this question. The first area that we've, where we're working differently is just in how we work. Um, that has, in fact, I think, been one of the most substantial changes. We transitioned in a matter of hours to an organisation where a relatively small proportion of us were field-based workers uh, uh, with huge travel footprints, uh, and a large proportion of us were office-based workers um, with all the, 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 the costs of that particular way of working into an entirely home-based organization. 
um, with a travel um, footprint of almost zero. And that's just our direct footprint. And having to learn how to communicate with each other um, remotely, effectively, how to learn, we've had to learn how to look after each other much more effectively remotely. Um, for us, one of our highest priorities throughout this period of self-isolation and quarantine has been putting people first, making sure that we could transition effectively to uh, distributed home working. Uh, and beyond that, a, a large part of what we do is convening people in much the same way as you do, Sally. And we've been learning a great deal and trying a lot of different ways to bring together stakeholders, bring together opinion formers, to try to understand and better develop ways in which we can support research and innovation. Some of them have proved very effective, um, certainly from the point of view of, 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 of convening large groups, making more use of, of things like Zoom or, or other online systems make it a lot more accessible. It's a lot easier to have a workshop when you can attend the workshop just by going downstairs, um, shouting children notwithstanding, than it is to uh, you know, get everyone to Manchester or to get everyone to Aberystwyth. So some of these elements will definitely keep, but we've also really learned the limitations. Um, I think that we've got a lot to learn about how you can effectively communicate online. The kind of collaborations that we're trying to build are not easy to do uh, over a Zoom call. And I think we're starting to see that impact in, in the kinds of projects and research ideas that we're being pitched. And then the other main way we changed is that we've had to respond incredibly quickly. So we have uh, uh, spearheaded all sorts of research initiatives uh, beyond our normal scope of operations, heavily involved in very rapidly uh, reworking research innovation towards vaccine development, very rapidly supporting the ventilator project, and also being very mindful of making sure we could support all the research innovation projects that we are currently funding. Um, and that's included running a, a, an emergency COVID-19 response competition where we've actually issued more funding awards in the space of a couple of weeks than we would do in a typical year at Innovate UK. Mm -hmm. um, and also having to develop very quickly things like continuity funding or uh, systems to allow for existing research projects to go on hold while companies who are real customers and universities that are also disrupted um, manage to work out how they're going to work in this space. And I would hope the things that we would keep from that is the ability to be much more flexible and rapid yeah. in, in funding innovation. And also, um, uh, as I said, harnessing the opportunities and overcoming the challenges of people being more happy to work online. Great. Thank you, Nick. And certainly from a forum's perspective, we recognize quite a lot of that. As you say, we rely on workshops to drive change and suddenly we're having to do it all online and a lot of very rapid learning to be had there. So last but no means least, uh, Rebecca, what has Unilever done differently in these times? Hi, Sally. Hi, hi everyone. Lovely to see you all. Um, I, I think I read a, a poll the other day from YouGov and it's, I think it was only 9% of people want to return to what was normal. So I think everyone, individuals and you know, us as a society and companies have all noticed actually there's something good could come out of this pandemic. Um, people do want to change and people have appreciated the simpler things in life and the cleaner air and the wildlife and it's, for me personally, stronger communities and much much less focus on the material and about your family and friends and so I, I would like to think that that will be the the underlying principles as we shift to, to, to the new normal I think from a from a work perspective similar to, to, to many of my, my contemporaries on the panel we um, as soon as COVID approached quickly changed the business into operating um, under five very distinct work streams which for a big multinational business with 150,000 employees around the world, for me, you know, a real change actually was the agility and the speed um, with which we acted. We haven't got time to, I know, to go into all the details, but we split up a, a big work stream on our own people, which is obviously the most important starting point. Um, as an office-based employee, I'm very lucky that I can work from home, but of course at Unilever, you know, the real heroes are actually the people who are working, producing, our, our, our goods in the factories around the world. So really thinking 
very carefully about ensuring that we had the right kind of working environments and um, the right safety protection, the right protocols in place, being able to ensure that we were shipping goods around the world. Many of those are essential items, soap, sanitizers, etc. And then thinking for our office based staff around really quite a, a marked change in communications and thinking about mental health as well, because it can be quite isolating working at home um, as well as the positives that, that you have with not commuting, etc. In terms of cash, we looked at making sure that we could really flex a strong balance sheet uh, to make sure that we could benefit the wider value chain that Unilever operates in. So, for example, we extended half a billion in credit to our, our small scale retailers and our small scale suppliers. Um, I think in terms of demand as a consumer goods company, clearly we saw huge changes in, in demand for our portfolio. So not a surprise to think that things like out of home ice cream eating wasn't happening when everyone was in lockdown, but of course a huge surge in home care, uh, uh, hygiene products and a huge surge in uh, soaps and personal care, cleaning products, etc. So we were able to do things like swap over, for example, our deodorants factory uh, in Leeds in the north of England from making deodorant to making sanitizer. And we quickly changed as well the way that we would deploy that. So instead of just normal consumer sized packs, actually big commercial size packs that were going straight out to ministries of health around the world and to NGOs in the UN. And then lastly, our work with communities, we set up two big platforms. One was 100 million euros of donation um, split around 50 of that into the World Economic Forum's COVID action platform. So to our big UN partners like UNICEF and UNHCR. And then the other half of it to, to smaller groups that we're working with, for example, Feeding America. Um, and then the second part is a project we have based out of the UK with the Department for International Development, which is a hundred million pound platform, hygiene and behavior change platform, which focuses on using Unilever's expertise in advertising and behavior change programs to promote good hygiene and hand washing around the world and partners up with DFIDs on the ground capabilities and a whole host of different NGOs and UN agencies to roll out those programs. And of course, we had to think very quickly in how we would adapt a lot of the work, which is traditionally based on face to face into rolling out through digital. So we've reached already about 330 million people with that program. That's stage one. We'll now move on to, to stage two. So I think in summary, a very um, uh, agile response, I think, from, from Unilever and and, and all the companies we've listened to today and many others around the world in being much quicker and sharper in responding to changing consumer needs. And I think from a, an external perspective, really trying to use and talk much more about the multi-stakeholder business model that we've always, um, we've always espoused as Unilever and really taking into consideration the importance of not going back to business as usual and thinking about how do we ensure that we don't take our eye off the ball on the two massive big macro issues that we all face around fighting climate change and around social inequity. We announced some changes around um, Unilever's environmental strategy a couple of weeks ago and we'll be doing something similar um, later this year around our social strategy. Great. Um... So what a rich story of how, as organizations, you've responded to this um, pandemic and some common themes there, definitely, uh, in terms of both the internal changes and external changes that you've all made, which have got really clear characteristics of speed, flexibility, agility. Um, I think certainly our experience of this pandemic has been that the impossible has become the possible almost overnight and the conversations that were really difficult to have you know we've now been able to have those um, and I'm struck by in your responses the humanness of the response in that front and center of your internal responses and external responses you know has been the need to put humans at at the heart of that response and I think above all else COVID is such a human story um, so encouraging shifts then in response to the pandemic thus far. As we now turn our focus to the sort of the second part of this conversation, which is how might we keep a lot of what we've seen and heard about, which is really positive, really aligned with sustainability and drive it even further as we sort of emerge from this crisis. And 
Leslie, you talked about um, opening minds and narrative. You know, there, that's some of the ways in which we'll start to make the transition from where we are to where we need to get to. Another lens on the question, which is, okay, what is it we need to do differently to ensure that the future emerges, that, the, that is a future that we want, is this lens of purpose. And so we have our second live poll. So this is to kind of get everyone galvanized again around um, this question, which will come up in a moment. Um, and it is follows. So since the outbreak of COVID-19, to what extent has your organization had to pivot its purpose? Um, full, some, few, not at all. Um, again, take a moment to um, respond if you wouldn't mind. So it's looking that some aspects is the most popular category which is reassuring as we thought about this live poll we didn't really know what we we're going to do if everyone said not at all because our whole theory of change as to how we might respond to this crisis in the way that drives sustainability sort of falls apart if um there's been no pivots whatsoever great um so interesting three percent a full pivot that is really interesting probably you know of equal interest but less surprising some aspects and then not at all. Very interesting. So some reconfiguration of purpose, but in some instances, not at all. Perhaps because actually, and this is the optimist in me, you were already very sustainable. So moving on to um, the second part of the discussion then. Um, just before I ask the panelists how they see their organizations contributing to um, a more sustainable future as we move forward, I'm gonna ask Hannah to share some of the emerging insights from our Future of Sustainability report. So we've been tracking dynamic areas, trends, and we can now see a number of different trajectories emerging right now. And so as the context for how we might really galvanize this change around us to drive the future that we want. Hannah, would you mind sharing a little bit about what we're discovering through our research? Yeah, love to. Hi everyone, um, great. thank you for joining us. And Forum has been known for futures since our inception, um, but quite often that would be looking about developing scenarios that might have quite a long time horizon. But now this year, change is happening so quickly that we've had to adapt how we're looking at futures. And so really we've been focusing on trajectories, so kind of the pathways out of this crisis and really trying to cluster signals of change around uh, each of these different trajectories that we're seeing. So what we're seeing is three main trajectories and then a fourth one, which I'll talk about afterwards. So um, each of these trajectories is kind of uh, characterized by a particular mindset that we're seeing. So the first up there in the green is the transform trajectory. And this is one that's really associated with a regenerative mindset, which where the focus is on planetary health and human health being absolutely interdependent on one another. Then we've got the collapse mindset, which is much more characterized by quite a strong self-interest and it is one where, for example, there's a closing in, there's less international collaboration, and there's much more of a focus on nationalism, for example. And then finally, the disciplined trajectory, which is where there's a big focus on using technology uh, to increase surveillance and security. And so that in order to achieve uh, the kind of public health programs, there's a trade off in uh, individual privacy and freedoms. And I mentioned signals of change and the kind of things that we're seeing across each of these. And so in the transform trajectory, one of the signals of change that we're seeing is a big call for green new deals and things like conditional bailouts that are happening within some countries where companies are being bailed out only on the condition that they are more regenerative in their approach. In the collapse mindset, uh, the kind of signals of change that we're seeing is, for example, buy, mass buying up of pharmaceuticals um, in the US, which means that it's not then available for, across the rest of the world. So this kind of closing in of borders and kind of each to their own and uh, a scarcity mindset. Um, and then in discipline, some of the test and trace models, very effective from a public health perspective, but then concerns arising about what that means for individual freedoms and privacy. 
And I mentioned that we're also seeing a fourth trajectory as well. And this we're calling unknown. And that's not just because the sort of clusters of things that don't fit neatly, but actually the fourth trajectory is around that there may not be a new normal. There may actually be a future where just waves of uncertainty and waves of crises may follow. And so it doesn't restabilize into anything that kind of resembles a new normal. And what we're seeing is that there's clusters of, of signals of change happening across each of these four areas, but also they naturally overlap as well. And this shows kind of how those uh, might intersect with each other. But what we know from having worked in futures for a long time is that the future, whilst very uncertain, doesn't just happen to us. We are actually co-creators in it. And given the level of discontinuity that's happening at the moment, is this is a huge opportunity for us very choicefully to decide what kind of future we want to emerge out of this as the prevailing one. Of course, they will all uh, emerge to a degree. Uh, Society is not a sort of linear, neat thing. Um, but actually, if we're going to be deliberately trying to orient towards a particular kind of future, there are choices that we can make in all of our roles in organisations that we, that we work in. It's also a critical point because the decisions that are made over the next six to 18 months will actually lay out what our future decade and indeed the future century will look like. So the window of opportunity for making decisions to orient towards a particular future is really critical. So this lexicon, if you like, of different trajectories and transform, discipline, collapse and unknown, is really just to help us have a framework to be able to talk about the kind of futures that we want to intentionally move towards, which I think leads on very nicely to the next question to the panellists. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, so with the knowledge from nearly two decades of futures work at Forum for the Future, that knowledge being that both self-fulfilling and self-defeating prophecies can become true, my next question to you all is, how might your organization help make this transform trajectory a reality on the basis that the more attention and focus we give this trajectory, the more likely it is to emerge? And I'll just go in the same order as before. And Keith, Bettis and Taylors, what will you do to ensure this transform trajectory emerges or help transform, help ensure it emerges? Because we can't guarantee anything. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And, and, and I think, you know, as a business, we have, um, we have a clear purpose, which is about uh, wanting to make a positive difference in the world. And, you know, in, in its simplest way, that can be from having a, you know, a decent cup of tea or a decent cup of coffee. Um, and, and much deeper to that, we absolutely recognise, and I heard that earlier from others, about the stakeholder model and the fact that we are interdependent on others for our future. I think family businesses, you know, are, are quite unique in, in many ways because they're generational and outlook and often it's not about maximizing, you know, short term uh, return. Um, but it's rather about, you know, how can that business be around for another 100, 200, 300 years and, and what needs to happen and change. Um, so, so I think, you know, our, our owners, our shareholders, you know, even though we're a small business in the big scheme of things, tiny on the on the world stage is to demonstrate leadership and to take risks in some of these big areas that we need to lean into um, be that about you know a uh, carbon neutral uh, industry be that about um, you know living wage and incomes and um, be that about you know making sure that we've got regenerative futures and really understanding what that means um, circular in design of our products um, and, and really to uh, spend, invest, model and uh, where possible and um, useful to take a leadership approach, but not in a shouty way, but in a humble way, which is about um, trying to play our part in securing the long term future. Great. Thank you, Keith. And I should also report that my optimism expressed earlier in response to the second poll around purpose was well founded because actually we should have had a category which was your purpose is already sustainable because we've had a bit of chat to say that um, for once my optimism was well founded often it is completely not well founded at all but today it has been so that's heartening to hear um, thank you very much for that Keith and I think it is really interesting isn't it the ability of a family business to really push into that leadership space but from a foundation perspective, Leslie, how will you ensure that this transform trajectory emerges? Great. Well, I, I'm, I'd like to speak for 
all philanthropic foundations, because I think there's three things that foundations need to do. And, and the first one is play nicely with each other, because this is a moment of truth. And as we know, the philanthropy industry is notorious for bringing too much ego to the table and for working in silos. And, you know, of course, there's many inspiring exceptions to that, but sometimes hard for foundations to play nicely with each other because we all suffer from the not invented here syndrome. And that's, that's the truth. So this crisis and the world that we want to build together means that we need to stop this. And we as funders need to collaborate. We need to build coalitions. We need to fund each other's theories of change as opposed to ours. Um, and so there's a lot that could be done about coming together. Um, and we're seeing this happening a bit. Laudas Foundation just joined a bunch of funders to cr create something called Forge, which is to give a voice to workers and social movements in the new economy that we want to build. So it's happening, but it needs to happen more. So that's number one. Number two, I think we need to make it easier. Again, funders, and you know this, Sally, uh, we've been funding you for many years. <laughs> it's not always we easy. We are very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> But we're complicated. And the one thing that COVID did is actually said you know, to funders, look, you need to make it easier. You need to be able to move quickly. Um, and we at Lauda signed with 772 other foundations, a pledge by the Council on Foundations to essentially do just that. Simplify processes, focus on core funding as opposed to programmatic, you know, removing the 25 page proposal so things can get done quicker. And then finally, I think philanthropy needs to focus on what philanthropy does best. I think we have an unprecedented opportunity to redesign a global economic system together. And philanthropy can play an important, and maybe it's, it's you know, what was said before, not a shouty role, but a quiet behind the scenes role in creating a more enabling environment. That could be policies, that could be financial incentives, that could be mainstreaming new economic thinking. So to the narrative point I made before, um, for example, there's a lot of great stuff coming out. Of course, Kate Raworth and her donut economics is, is very inspiring. But what does that mean in practice? So that's where philanthropy can come in to actually test that, to work with the city of Amsterdam as an example, and show what this looks like uh, in practice. So there's certainly a role for us. And I beg all foundations on this line, uh, please come together and collaborate more. Thank you, Leslie. And the same can be said for the nonprofit sector as well. There's definitely a case of not invented here. And um, the same call you make to philanthropies, I would make to nonprofits as well. Um, I think we all could do a better job of collaborating. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So let's move to Nick. What is Innovate UK going to do, Nick, to help ensure a transform emerges? Well, so we're uh, hopefully uh, one of those organizations that uh, having ticked the not have to pivot very much, we'll really focus on continuing to do what we've been doing. Um, you know, at, at a very um, direct level, the direct investments we make, uh, we are uh, as an organization as a whole, UKRI, uh, continuously developing and implementing our own sustainability strategies. Uh, this is a first for the organization as a whole. Um, and we're starting now to overlay uh, actually using environmental performance as one of the tests for the direct investments we make. Whereas previously we would of course had to have de derived sort of value for money and support research excellence. Now we're actually starting to require the things that we, we buy ourselves, whether it's a, a new boat for NERC or, or a new um, space simulation chamber for somewhere else. Uh, these are things that we're, we're starting to integrate the requirement for environmental performance. But of course, by far the largest element or way in which we can support the sort of transform agenda is to keep making sure that we are stimulating and supporting research and innovation in this area. You already see, uh, you know, the, the word transform embedded in the title of many of our programs, from transforming food production, transforming construction, you know, prospering from the energy revolution. We were already on this trajectory. And uh, if we start to digest what the very recently published um, uh, R&D roadmap, we start to pass the signals coming from government and Bayes around the Build Back Better agenda, you're going to see a lot more work in this space and us increasingly asking questions of people with ideas of what are the sustainability factors here? How is this sustainable innovation? How is this contributing to system change? How is this inclusive? 
And just to finish by the fact that we, we've just announced the first major, if you like, post-pandemic competition that we're running. And although it's still to support impacts from the pandemic, it is called the Sustainable Innovation Fund. Um, as we've also worked with Forum for many years, I can't remember the last time we actually got the S word into the title of something, but the best part of 200 million pounds is available to projects that will have to focus on things like decarbonizing energy uh, in business and industry, um, uh, improving the energy efficiency, heating, cooling of our homes, accelerating the shift to low carbon transport. Um, you know, it's our role and responsibility to drive innovation towards that brighter future. Great. Thank you. I'm very happy to see the S word in there. That's, I know. that's cheered me up. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Um, okay, Rebecca. Um, obviously, you've been quite busy as an organisation, really, I think, setting out how you see the pathway to building back better. So tell us, how does Unilever see its role in helping create this transform trajectory? Well, I think in terms of the journey for us th th this year is also um for unilever it's, it's the end of our unilever sustainable living plan so we set out some ambitious targets in 2010 and, and not all but quite a lot of them had an end date of 2020 so prior to covid um, from last year we've been looking at what does that mean for the next stage of our business and how do we move from having the unilever sustainable living plan and make sure that we take the learnings from that and the achievements and we let you know leverage what went very well um, and build it into what we're now calling the compass which is a holistic operating framework that still continues to put Unilever's overarching vision around making sustainable living commonplace clearly with with covid we've taken a look at the work that we've been doing to ensure that in this new normal world it, are we still absolutely fit for purpose or what changes might we need to make to really split it into, into four stages. It's looking across how do we transform our own business and our own operations. And I talked a little bit about some of those changes in, in, in the last question. Then the second stage is looking across our wider value chain. So what does that mean right the way from the sourcing of our, our crops and commodities through to their production, the manufacturing, the brands, the way we talk about them in society, Finally, the, the, the disposal of those products and moving from what was traditionally a linear consumer goods model into a proper circular economy. So I think when you think about what I said, said earlier about the two big challenges around climate and, and, and social equity, I think the announcement we made a couple of weeks ago with the new environmental strategy shows how we might bring that to life. So for example, we'll now prioritize suppliers who've got their own science-based climate targets we're developing a new regenerative agriculture code that puts the farmer right at the center of the work that we're doing. You know, they are the custodian of the land. So thinking about things like financial inclusion programs, thinking about water stewardship programs that we're rolling out now around all of our sites that really focus on the sensible use of water and making sure that we're working together with local communities to solve that. We're doing a lot of work on small scale retailers, providing access to credit and into the digital economy. I think you know, the, third, the third stage in that journey is, is around using our brands to drive change. So for a long time, Unilever has talked about purpose and purpose-led brands. So we've seen already some examples with brands like Domestos and Lifebuoy, very COVID-specific advertising that we've used around the world, encouraging people to make sure they're practicing good hygiene um, uh, and good sanitation. But also you're doing the same thing, but on social. So Brands like PG Tips here in the UK that talked a lot about connecting people and combating loneliness. Ben and Jerry's on a lot of big social issues. Um, and again, they were very outspoken and, and, and very committed about encouraging change on, on, on social inequity that is endemic across society. Sheer butter um, in, in the USA. And when we, again, when I look back at the announcement we made a couple of weeks ago, part of that was a billion euro fund that we've set up to bring to life our climate and nature commitments through Unilever's brands. And then I think that the last part of it is around what can we do as a business in wider society? So we've committed to carbon labeling, for example, on all of our products. We've launched the Unstereotype Alliance a few years ago. 
industry, starting uh, on a partnership we have with UN Women to change the way that gender is portrayed in advertising, but actually now I'm moving into other areas to tackle other issues around social equity and really encouraging right across the advertising sector a different and more realistic portrayal of people and stereotypes in advertising because that really can start to influence at a normative level the way that that's, that different parts of society are portrayed uh, uh, around the world and then i think you know last, lastly it's looking at how can we use our power as a business to work with other businesses and with and with other governments to really focus on you know getting those science-based targets in place, making sure that when governments are consulting on the stimulus packages that they're using now post-COVID, that we prioritise societies and, and demographics that really absolutely need the help because, you know, we, we've already started to see around the world as we have the wave of, 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 of of health issues that come with COVID, the second part of that is then the, the issues that the, and the ramifications on livelihoods and on jobs. And we know that a deep recession is going to exacerbate the existing inequalities and make them even worse. You know, I think really talking much more about the shift to stakeholder capitalism rather than around shareholder return, and it's absolutely vital that, that multi-stakeholder model. So I think in summary, it's those four stages. It's our own operations, it's our value chain, it's what we can do through our brands, and then what we can do to try and link in with others to come up with collective solutions. Great, uh, that's really clear and um, reassuringly systemic in that you've got nested layers of, of activities there, which is great to hear. Um, so I, I was struck again by some commonality there in the ways in which you are paying attention to that transform trajectory and certainly saw commonalities around um, collaboration both within your sectors and, and outside of sectors um, that strong point of view so having a real kind of a point of view about what needs to happen next and for me there was another theme around additionality so ensuring that everything you do drives maximum change be that through um, funding NERC's new ship Nick um, through pushing living wage through the supply chain and obviously Leslie through every philanthropic dollar invested driving maximum benefits in, in multiple systems and um, similarly Rebecca obviously Unilever ha is home to some really iconic brands so really leveraging those brands to drive additional benefits in, in the broader world that we live in. So our third and final last live poll kind of picks up this scene because we are keen to know from you all in the conversation today um, what would support you and your organization to really help deliver transform um, and we've already touched on some of these collaboration in particular but we just take a moment to have a think about what support as your own organization you might need to really pay attention to this transform trajectory cross-sectoral collaboration really coming out followed shortly by collaboration which you know echoed I think a lot of what you all um, said in your responses um, really interesting there um, and I, I'm I think what is encouraging here is that policy advocacy line in the certainly what we are seeing at forum is a genuine moment and i wrote about this in uh, an article last week a moment for business and philanthropy to find their voice and to really be clear about what it is that they'd like to see from government in particular to drive structural and economic reform so i'm glad to see that 27 percent of people think that that's also important um, but cross-sectoral collaboration is our clear winner and I think speaks to the need that the solutions that we need to deliver to make transform a reality won't come from one part of the economy or one sector on its own. So we have a whole five minutes um, to see if there's been any questions coming through. So Hannah, I think has been monitoring what might be emerging in the chat and the Q and A. Hannah, are there any pissy insightful questions to pose to one or more of our panelists 
Yes, indeed. So there was uh, some clusters that have been emerging out of these. Um, so one very strong one was actually about inequality and the fact that this crisis has shone a light on inequalities and vulnerabilities in society. And then that closely follows by the Black Lives Matter protests. So uh, there were several questions around inequality collectively, slightly differently framed. But I think what I'll do is cluster these together and to each of the panelists just uh, very quickly to say, what are you doing uh, to tackle inequality at the same time as tackling planetary uh, challenges that you're each looking at in your organisations? And 30 seconds each panelist, if you don't mind. Uh, go with Keith. We'll just do the same order. So Keith, go to you first. Yeah, I mean, I think the first big thing is to recognise that there is uh, inequality, which we do um, as a business. And I think even with Black Lives Matter, you know, it's made us have some different internal conversations to the ones that we we're having before. So recognising there's lots of useful conversations going on. I, I think the other one is, is the de dependency that we have on others and um, making sure um, that we can um, create a value model um, which is more equal than it is currently. And I'm talking about value distribution in terms of costs, prices paid, and who benefits from that. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, me. Let's see. I can go, yes. yes. Um, so thank you. So uh, for us as a foundation, inequality is one of the other problems we're tackling. It's climate breakdown and inequality. So it's very much core to what we're trying to do. There's different approaches. Of course, COVID has accentuated uh, what we're doing. I think first and foremost, we apply a very strong gender equity and inclusion lens, not only to how we fund and everything we fund, but also how we operate internally. So looking at our own policies and procedures, our governance, et cetera, to make sure we have diverse voices in, that's super important. But secondly, in the work that we're doing, we wanna make sure that people who normally don't have a voice have a seat at the table. And you may have heard, you know, nothing about us without us. You know, we do a lot of work in the apparel sector. We want to make sure that workers have a seat at the table, and they should. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that workers understand their rights and they're able to negotiate for those rights. So a lot of our bottom-up work around labor rights very much touches on the core of what may perpetuate this inequality. Thank you, Leslie. Nick? I think it mirrors some of what's been said before. As an organisation, we're paying particular attention um, and, and have been for some time uh, around issues of equality, diversity and inclusion, uh, particularly as it pertains to all of our governance functions as well as throughout our recruitment. But more specifically, um, we do recognise the importance of making sure that the service that we offer, support for innovation projects, is equally accessible to all. Uh, and so we uh, have begun and will continue to run specific outreach uh, activities. Uh, it started with our Women in Innovation program. Uh, this moved on to our Young Innovators program, uh, particularly targeting young people. And others are sort of actively being developed, looking at how we can ensure that the right tools uh, and the right access is provided to everybody to support them when they want to innovate. Thanks. Rebecca. I was on mute, sorry. Um, well, I think I talked a, a, a little bit about, um, for us, we'd already split up our work, I think, into the five key areas, sorry, the uh, two key areas around climate and around social inequity. I think when it comes to social inequity, we've really looked at, I think, five stage process. So, you know, firstly, again, starting with our workforce, looking at ensuring we've got diversity right the way across our workforce to reflect the communities that we're serving around the world. I think the second is around, again, looking across the, the value chain. So I talked about how we were putting a diversity lens onto, onto our procurement. We'll continue to do that, but expand it even further. And then right across the value chain, thinking about livelihoods and about opportunities for better inclusion with small scale retailers, with last mile distribution, and making sure that we continue to roll out those programs in lots of countries around the world. I think the third area, and again, I've talked about it in a different context before, is using our brands to take a, to take a stance on social issues. So you know, I talked a bit about some of the work that brands like Ben and Jerry's have done, Dove have done around trying to end stereotypes around beauty. 
just recently in the US, we, we, we pledged a um, million dollars to organizations and activists who are working around social justice and, and racial equality. But I think we will continue to do that. And as the brands roll out their, their campaigns that are, that, that, are, that are at the moment, really a big, big focus on making sure that they stand up for social justice and around racial equity. Um, and then I think lastly, really reinforcing at Unilever that we have a zero tolerance uh, policy on any level of intolerance. So that's our employees, our suppliers, customers, partners, etc. cetera. Um, and then I think lastly, looking at again, as we talked about before with, with the um, build back stronger and change trajectory, looking at how we can try and use our influence as a global business to, to better advocate for systems when we're looking at the stimulus packages that ensure much greater focus on social equity and ensuring that when you look at the build back packages and you look at the stimulus and the money that's available that is distributed to communities and to areas that really do need that otherwise we're just going to end up actually accentuating the problem um, if we enter into a recession. Great. Thank you all very much. Um, well, we're coming to a close of this conversation. I wish we had longer. I wish we were all in the same room as well. But anyway, uh, a girl can wish. Um, what I'd like to do um, now is just to tell you a bit more about what's going to happen next after this conversation. But panelists, I'd like to put you on notice. You've got about two minutes to think about this question. And I'd like one sentence from you all just before we finish right at the top of the hour. What is the one thing that gives you most cause for optimism? It could be work related, that probably would be better, but it might not be. Um, so the one thing that you can see right now that gives you cause for optimism, if you can have a noodle on that, and if we can just show the last couple of slides, please, Valentina, um, because this conversation today is really important. It is a key input into our future sustainability report. Um, this year's report will not only shine a light on the trajectories that Hannah talked you through, but also will explore these really highly dynamic areas and will be our contribution as forum as to really outline what we think business, philanthropy, government needs to do to really ensure that this decisive decade, this decade of delivery does deliver sustainable development. Um, so the conversation today is super insightful. I can see there's quite a bit on the chat. We'll feed that into the, the gathering of the insights. Um, I'd like to say thank you to our partners on this journey, um, two of whom are on the call today, um, who've contributed not just financial support, which as a small nonprofit is super important, but also um, their time, their energy, their insights. And um, this is a conversation that still could get bigger. So if you're interested in getting involved in future sustainability, let us know. The final thing I wanted to say is that as I mentioned right at the beginning, this is the first of three webinars where we'll be asking very similar questions with again a mix of panelists. Um, the next one is geared to an Asia time zone, 22nd of July, and then the last is geared to a US time zone. Um, so if you like today, come back for more. Although if you're in the US right now, then that first one won't make any sense at all because it'll be in the middle of your night. Um, so if we can just um, move back to the panelist then, um, your one sentence as to what do you see that gives you most cause for optimism? Keith. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's personal and professional, but it's um, strength of relationships and strength of community. And, and I mean that here where I live in, in, in Ripon, uh, the, the communities um, of people that work, uh, you know, around Yorkshire and our overseas um, communities and the strength of that. Great. Nick, thank you. One sentence. So I'm going to refer to what I said earlier. The fact that last week my colleagues and I were able to open a £200 million competition called the Sustainable Innovation Fund. I Brilliant. couldn't have done that five years ago. Great. Leslie. I am inspired by the fact that we have woken up as the world. Our minds are open. I was going to use the word woke, but I think I'm too old for that. <laughs> but we're ready for change and people realize that. Brilliant. Thank you. Rebecca. Was it Leslie or not too old to use that? <laughs> um, I'm actually inspired by maybe like you, Sally, I'm a bit of an optimist. And I think that 
there is a greater focus now on companies and organizations that do the right thing. There was some medal research that said people are now much more likely to buy or not buy or associate themselves with companies that have acted with crisis, small, big, or anything yep. in between. So I think that's a shift in society that I'd like to see more of. Perfect. And I will end by saying what gives me cause for optimism is this conversation because it reinforces what I really believe to be a truth. We have an unprecedented opportunity to redesign our global economy um, through changing value distributions, through embracing regenerative principles. And I would just like to end by thanking you all panelists for being so brilliant and for those of you online and just leave you with my final thought, which is what we all do right now, professionally and personally, has never mattered more. It will all count. And the more attention we pay to that transform trajectory, the more likely it is it will emerge. And we really need it to emerge. So thank you all very much. Um, we're at time. That's amazing. Well done, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> um, we'll you. we'll be recording this, sharing it. But thank you all very much. It's been a great conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.